Hey, welcome back to the SQL Server 2016 Administration course. This video is on column level encryption. In this video, we'll take a look at column level encryption. We'll talk about the different options that exist in SQL Server. We'll certainly learn how to create certificates for strong protection of your data. And we'll look at how we create symmetric keys and actually encrypt the data in our systems. Column level encryption is a feature that's been in SQL Server since 2005. This is direct encryption of data in a column, and it's really at the row or cell level, not the column level, but we typically apply encryption to a column. Now this does require code changes because the programming that you use in T-SQL is what will actually manage the encryption for the encrypt and decrypt portions of your data. Now it's a very granular way of encrypting data. As I said, it's not an entire column, and there are implementations where people will use different encryption keys for different rows depending on some aspect of the data. For example, a particular customer or a particular doctor or something like that. Common level encryption does store the keys on the server, so it requires that we trust the server and we have control of the physical server itself. It also requires code changes in that we need binary columns to hold the encrypted data. Unlike always encrypted, we can't keep our varchar, integer, or date columns. We actually need a binary column to hold the actual binary encryption of the data. Encryption typically requires a lot of CPU work, and in modern implementations, the GPUs and your graphics card are used. We strike a balance between the amount of CPU we use to encrypt the data and the amount of protection by splitting up our encryption mechanism. So we typically use a symmetric key to encrypt data. Now this is stronger than uh, most simplistic encryptions, like you know, ROT13 or something. It does take some CPU, but it's order of magnitude less CPU intensive than something like an asymmetric key or a certificate. So we typically use a symmetric key to encrypt data and then what we do is we protect that with an asymmetric key or certificate, which is much, much stronger encryption. But that protection is usually only then used once to decrypt the symmetric key. Now, symmetric keys are created in a database, and they're deterministic if we use the same parameters. And when we get to the demo, I'll show you what we mean by that. There are a number of algorithms available. There's RC4, RC5, DES algorithms. But at this point, only the AES algorithms or Blowfish algorithms should be used. The others have been shown to have cryptological weaknesses, and they can be attacked. I suggest you use the AES algorithm and choose the longest key you can. Now, as I mentioned, these keys are usually protected by an asymmetric key or certificate. We can create those, and then we usually protect those keys by passwords. The other option we have is that we can use temporary keys that are created and then don't exist on the server any longer. But again, this is code change for your application. Because we're managing this in code, there's a couple things we have to do. One of these is that we have to open up the keys before we can use them. So this means if I'm using a symmetric key to encrypt my data, I have to open it before I can actually perform encryption or decryption. Because I need to potentially decrypt the symmetric key, I also have to open any other keys that might be protecting it. There are a number of functions that are used to encrypt and decrypt data, and they have to be called in your application code, whether that's inside of a store procedure in SQL Server or sent in a batch from your application. Now, the keys are typically closed when the session ends, though best practice would be that you want to close your keys when you're done using them. Let's look at a demo where we encrypt some data with symmetric keys so that you can see how this works in code. This is a fairly simplistic demo and it's nowhere near the amount of work you would have to do in a typical application if you want to do this encryption. So I've got a full demo set up and I'm going to run a bunch of code that you can see. Now we'll use our database here and then what we're going to do is I want to create a table and insert some data in there and then I'm just going to select it back so we can look at it. So let's do this now. This is a demo I've done before where I've created a table and I'm kind of mocking up. I've got a number of users with some title and some salary here. In this case, uh, these are my kids and they don't get paid as much as I do. Now, I don't want to disclose my salary. All right, typically this is an item I want to protect in some sort of HR application or something else. So I want to encrypt it. However, this column, as we see up here, is a numeric value. To store the encrypted data, I need to add a var binary column. So let's do that. Uh, it doesn't have to be a max, but I typically use max rather than uh, run into the case where a new algorithm would cause me issues. Now, the way that this typically works is we need to do a hierarchy of keys. So the Windows Data Protection API, the DP API is the base, and this is on your Windows host. The server master key is automatically created for SQL Server. So this key protects this key, this key, now protects the database master keys. This is not the master database. This is just the nomenclature for a master key. So that's what we're gonna create here is that I'm checking to see if one exists. It is a hard-coded 101. And if not, I'll create the master key and then I'll encrypt it by the password. Now it is encrypted by the service master key, but if I ever break that encryption or we ever need to do a backup, I wanna have a password against it. So let's go ahead and do this. 
Once that's done, we'll continue on the hierarchy. We'll add an asymmetric key or certificate. Well, I could do either one, and then a symmetric key. Now this is the one that is very CPU intensive, so I want to open and close this or decrypt it as little as possible. This will encrypt this key. So I'll do that once when I do the data, and then I'll use a symmetric key to perform decryption. So now we'll create a symmetric key. And as with other objects, I have DDL, I give it a name, and then I have numerous algorithms here. So if I pull up my IntelliSense, what we'll see is there's a number of algorithms here. There's DES, there's RCT, RC4. As I mentioned, most of these really have cryptological weaknesses. The AES algorithms are the only ones that you should be using at this point in time. We have a couple of parameters. We have an identity value and a key source. These two values together, they create the certificate in a deterministic way. So if I always use this same value here and the same value here, I'll end up with the same key in another database, or if I have to recreate this key. I cannot back these up, so uh, having the ability to do this is important. And then I want to protect this symmetric key. Again, this is, it's a strong key, but relatively weak in the encryption world. So I protect it by encrypting this key with the asymmetric key that I created above. I could use certificate here, or if I had an HSA box, I could use some other mechanism, but in this case, I'll use that. So let's run this. Now, once that's done, I want to encrypt my data. Now, this is the part where code would actually need to change. So for example, I need to open the symmetric key and I could say decryption by, but this actually will give me an error because I haven't provided a password. Uh, in this case, an asymmetric key has a public and private side. That private side is what I need to do the encryption. So I need to open this and decrypt with the password. Once that's done, in my session, as I'm connected now to SQL Server, that key is available. So what I can do is update my employees. I'll set that new column equal to the salary, but I'm passing it as this encrypt by key. And you'll notice here in the, the help that I get, encrypt by key takes a, the GUID or the symmetric key, the clear text, and then optional parameters. In this case, I use the key GUID function to get the GUID. You just pass the name. It's a much simpler method of doing this. So I'll execute that, and then my code is encrypted. And if I now look at the table, remember this was the unencrypted value that's numeric. This is the varchar, or sorry, the var binary value. You'll see that it's encrypted. And these are different values as we look through here. Uh, they're the same out to about here, and then they become different. This is actually a header that tells me which key is being used. It's a hash of the key. Now, if I want to decrypt this data, there's a decrypt guide by key function, and I can do that. But what you'll see here is that I don't get this back correctly because decrypt by key actually returns a binary value. I need to cast it back. I need to cast as nvarchar and then as numeric. So let's run all of this code here. And once we do that, you'll see I get the, the original value and the decrypted value here together. Now for the rest of the demo, I want to show you a little bit about how this encryption works and potential issues. So I've got a problem here. If I perform this update, where I change the encrypted salary to some other value, I can do that. And what I've really done at this point in time is I've changed the salary value. Now there's the original value, but if I decrypt it, you'll see that we've had this update. Essentially what we have here is we've had an attack without decryption by somebody just performing an update. This is one of the reasons that SQL injection and ad hoc queries are potentially a big problem. Now I can fix this. Let me add a row GUID column to my table. And I just set that to new ID so I get a different number of values for each row. And let's look at this so we can see what we have. You'll see that these are all different. Now the encrypted value is still there. I just didn't return it here. Now I'm going to re-encrypt data. So in this case, I'm going to take the salary again because I haven't removed this column, which I would typically do in an application. And I'll do the encrypt by key again. But this time you'll notice I add a one and I ask this row GUID as an NVAR charm. So if you look at the help, you'll see that there's an optional add authenticator and then the authenticator value. Typically, I would do this in another table if I was doing this in an actual application. But by this case, what I'm going to do is when the encryption occurs, not only will the key be used, but this row good will be used as a kind of additional parameter or additional salt value to protect. So if I look at my data again, and I'll get the decrypted salary here again, it's what I expect, right? Everything is correct because I re-encrypted this value again to into my table. Let's perform that same attack. So again, I'm going to take my encrypted value for this row and I'm going to put it in this row. Now, when I try to select this data, 
what actually happens is these two encrypted values are the same, right? This one was copied here, but because these row GUIDs are different, when I do the authentication piece for the decryption, I can't decrypt it to something that makes sense and I end up with a null value. That allows me a little bit of protection against random updates getting through my encryption. A few items to keep in mind. This encryption is again at the row level, so I can encrypt different rows of data with different key values. For example, I could use two different symmetric keys and encrypt the different rows in my table with those different symmetric keys, protect those by different certificates or asymmetric keys, and give access to different users. That would prevent users from being able to read other data in the table. Now, symmetric keys can be protected by passwords instead of keys. Don't necessarily recommend that because then I've got to submit that password and put it in code and everything else, but you could do that. One of the advantages of using the two-stage encryption with the asymmetric key and certificate is that I can limit access to those with SQL permissions. So that is one way to potentially protect access there, but I am not preventing the, the DBA or anybody with sysadmin access from actually getting to those keys and then decrypting data. Again, code changes are needed for this. And it is a CPA intensive in in operation. Because this data is not indexable, if I wanted to perform queries against this data that's encrypted, I would need to decrypt it and then pass along those decrypted results to the CPU or to the query optimizer. So in my where clause, I might have to say where salary equals decrypt by key and then include the column and the key and all that, which means that I'm decrypting every row of data in order to determine if those rows should be returned. It can be a very high load on your CPU and on your server. This is good encryption, but it's best used very judiciously and in very few places. In the next video, we'll take a look at row level security.